I was just sitting there and thinking, what's going to happen next? And then I remember, oh, that's me. <laughs> anyway, good morning. We're glad you're here and Jesus loves you and he is so wonderful. And um, uh, what a beautiful congregation we have this morning. I'd like to say thank you as well for your help with the food pantry yesterday and your help especially with George's funeral. Her family was so, so appreciative and, and um, uh, I thank you because I think we did them right. You know, uh, George's husband was an ordained Nazarene elder and he uh, spoke right from this pulpit and uh, he was just a great guy. I never got to meet him, but I know he was a great guy because all Nazarene pastors are great people, aren't they? I mean, gee. Anyway, I know Georgia, and she was a great gal, and I'm going to miss her smile, but, but we ju I just want to say thank you. The food was wonderful, and the cleanup was, went so perfect, and everything just went wonderful. And Ruth and Marty, I'd like to welcome you back. I I'm glad to see you. I know you're just traveling through, but you're always welcome here. And um, uh, and Eldon and Carolyn, Carolyn, you're just like family now. <laughs> I mean, we're going to let you go back and visit your old church, but remember, this is where you belong. We love you today. We praise you. Praise God for your blessing since you've been here. I've had people tell me they really enjoy having you in their Sunday school class. That, that's a high compliment, amen? So we praise the Lord. Today, my sermon is love. The name of it is love is all we need. Love is all you need. Love is all I need. Love is all we need. And it's based in chap Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. And two or three weeks ago, you remember I left and I went to the district ministry board meetings. And uh, we were interviewing the potential ordination candidates. And um, uh, we were also hearing the first year students who needed to have their divorce barriers removed. Because the Nazarene church just, don't, just doesn't ordain anybody. And um, uh, if you have something that we have to look at, we prefer to do it the first year instead of waiting until you go all the way through the process and then saying no. But if you've never been there, and I imagine most of you never have, there might be one or two of us, well, LaDonna's been there, I know, and, and it wouldn't surprise me if Marty hasn't done it. And, uh, but uh, when you're there, you know, there's just a bunch of people, all pastors, district superintendents and and they're listening to these people give their testimonies their testimonies of how they got saved and how they were called to be, become full-time workers in God's ministry and the first year students also get to share about their divorces and we're not going to talk about the divorces today and that wouldn't be right but to hear people talk about their testimony and their lives for two days in a row, one right after another. One of the things that you recognize is that there is a common theme working in the lives of people. And that theme is love. One candidate who wasn't a Nazarene, he was a Christian, but he wasn't a Nazarene, was talking about his wife who was up for ordination and he said that he had thoroughly enjoyed her faith journey and it was an honorable one and one that he was glad to be a part of. He just, just, I don't know if he was a Baptist or what and we don't want to talk about the Baptists today. They're fine people. We love them. But he noticed that it was different that his wife was a Nazarene, holiness and, and, and the love of God. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We all know also how devastating divorces can be. And some of the stories we heard, in fact, all the stories we heard that pertain to divorce were heartbreaking. I mean, to say the very least, one even included a murder. 
whether you believe it or not. But it wasn't the candidate who was going for ordination. <laughs> I want you to know that. But um, uh, divorce always devastates a family. And even the ordination candidates, I don't know, that might help, can't hurt any. Even the ordination candidates had stories that they came from broken past, broken families, broken past. They were not Christians. And the thing that made the difference in their life was the unconditional love that they found when they walked through the doors of a Nazarene church. Now, I think we could say that is probably true of many churches, not just Nazarene churches. But there was a common thread in all the testimonies we heard, and that was that each candidate lives were changed because of the churches and the people in them who loved them. Many of those people were so broken when they walked through the doors of the Nazarene church and they found the love of God. The people in those churches loved them so unconditionally. Their testimony was that they had become new creatures in Christ Jesus. Each one, of course, you couldn't be an ordain, ordination candidate if you weren't saved, but each one testified to the fact that the love of God had came to them through God's people and that they were loved in such a way that it changed their life. And that's what every Christian church and individual needs to witness, the unconditional love of God. Nothing says, I love you, like when you find out that Jesus died on the cross for you. And I'm here to tell you today that if you would have been the only person in the world, Jesus would have died for you. When there was only two people, God already had this plan. Before there was any people, God had this plan. The best day of my life was when a little church loved me unconditionally and made me part of their family. Really, just Corinthians chapter 13, when you break it down into just as few words as possible, what it is saying is all you need is love. John Lennon took this theme, and this will probably be the only time you hear me talk about John Lennon from the pulpit, but he took this theme and he wrote a song, All You Need Is Love. And that song was the number one hit on the charts for 11 weeks in 1999. And don't worry, I'm not going to sing it for you today. I believe the reason the song was such a big hit was that the lyrics were true and the people knew they were true. Didn't matter who was singing it or what the testimony of his life was. They knew the lyrics was true. Love changes lives. I don't know what encouraged John Lennon to write it, but it almost sounds as, as if he got the theme from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, the love chapter, Paul says in it, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, I want you to know that's a long way around the barn to say all you need is God's love. The Apostle Paul says you can have all these qualities, speaking in the tongues of men and angels. I bet you all wish you had a pastor that could do that. Having the gift of prophecy and being able to understand all mysteries and knowledge what wisdom this speaks of. He said, you can even be a superman and move mountains with your faith. And even if you give all that you have to the poor and sacrifice your life for others, but you don't have the love of God, you gain nothing. Which is just another way of saying all you need is love. The apostle goes on to describe this love that God imparts to his children in verses, in verses 4 through 7. He says love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor. 
others, is not self-seeking, is not easily angered. He keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hope, always persevere. Love never fails. If you want to succeed at something, go at it with an attitude of love. He's not describing the love of the world. No, this is the way God loves, and this is the way his children should love. This kind of love, the interviewee spoke of, was an unconditional love gave freely with nothing expected in return. That's the kind of, that's the kind of love that God has. Unconditional love requires nothing in return. It is always freely given. It's evident that the Apostle Paul thought this love was of utmost importance because he spends the whole of chapter 13 about this love, God's kind of love. There is a story told about the Apostle John that says near the end of his life when he was very, very old, after he was boiled in oil, which is not found in the Bible, but in church records, and he didn't die, and then he was banished to the island of Potmus, that after all that, that the men of his church would carry him seated in his chair to do the service. And at the end of every service, he would say the same words. He would say, my little children love one another. One Sunday he was asked why his response was always the same. Why do you always tell us to love one another? And he simply said, because love is all you need to get to heaven. But it's got to be God's kind of love. Now, I can't swear to you that this story is true because I'm not that old, but what is true is the fact that the love of God is all you really need. First Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 8, well, Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. I want to tell you something. When people come to the church, they should find the love that covers a multitude of sins. Amen? We, we, we live in a world where the blame game reigns supreme. In the media, in politics, in life, it's always the other guy's fault. And it's always your job to make sure everybody knows it's the other guy's fault. But with God's kingdom, love should cover the sins of our lives. Not just our lives, but everybody who walks through our doors. Unconditional love, the love of God can do all things. It never fails. That's what Paul, uh, Paul tells us in verses 7 and 8. He, he says, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And verse 8 says, love never fails. I think it's the second shortest verse in the Bible. I'm so convinced that the one key element, component, or theme of a successful, growing, and robust church is this unconditional love. There are other components involved, but the unconditional love is the key element. You can have all the other elements, all these other things, you can speak like an angel. You can move mountains with your faith. You can give your body over for hardship. But if you don't have the love of God, Paul says you gain nothing. The love of Christ is more contagious than COVID. But the key to either COVID or love taking root in a person's life is a person must be exposed to it. One of the elements that was key that day when we heard those people give their testimonies and talk about their call to be full-time ministers in God's kingdom was the fact that they were exposed to a love that they couldn't get past. They, they, they were infected with this love that spread through their lives, and now they want to help expose others to this infectious kind of love. God's love is contagious and you cannot be exposed to it 
and not be affected. Now, I'm not saying that everybody's affected for the good, but in my opinion, when you're exposed to God's love, you either have his love start to grow in your heart and grow to love others, or you become bitter and bitter and resentment grow in your heart. I think sometimes we look at this duty to love others for Christ as a task that we must check off of our list. Well, Paul says we got to love. Jesus says we got to love. So I love today. I'm on my way to heaven. It almost like it's work. I was worked for a very successful man one time. He was multimillionaire many, many times over, and, and that the name of his company, and he owned many businesses, was Big Smith Overalls. How many of you ever heard of Big Smith Overalls? Before blue jeans was famous, Big Smith was everything. And he, he was multimillionaire, and he told me, he said, when you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. And that's the way loving people is. When you love people because that's what you have in your heart, it never becomes work to you. It never becomes a checklist. Love always pays dividends in our lives. It's, not, it's a lot like paying tithe. Now, I know that you don't want me to talk about tithes, but love is a lot like paying tithes. No matter how much you give God, God always gives more in return. Amen? And you never understand how the tithe works in your life to bless you until you start paying your tithe. Amen? I mean, how many can say, well, before I ever tithed it, I knew that's what God wanted me to do, and it was going to be a blessing. Well, how long did you have that information before you started? Love is a lot like tithe. Until you... I want to say God has always loved you. From the beginning, before you were ever born, God has loved you. But you never understand the love of God until you start loving God in return. Amen? When you start loving God, then the love of God becomes clearer and clearer in your life. And the longer you walk with him, the clearer it gets. Benjamin Franklin describes what Philadelphia was like in his autobiography. I like read autobiographies of famous men. And uh, he said, when night fell on the city, darkness reigned and people would trip over the rough cobblestones in the sidewalks. And when there was no sidewalks, people would walk in the mud puddles. There were people sleeping in the streets. And he said, and the worst part, of all, was to sit, it wasn't safe to be out after dark because crime ruled the night. Sounds like he lives today, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, so Franklin waged an intense campaign, both written and in speeches, for people to light the area around their house with kerosene lamps. He said he thought it was a very simple ideal. We can change our city by just each one of us putting out kerosene lamps. But nobody listened to him. No one put out these kerosene lamps. After a few months or years, I don't know how long, Ben Franklin got a novel ideal. He said, I'll put out a kerosene lamp. So he hired a man, and they put a post out, and they attached the kerosene lamp to it. And Ben went out and lit it that night. And that night, there was one house in Philadelphia that was bathed in the warm light. A few nights later on Franklin Street, there was another light. And every night there were more and more lights in the city until soon the light spread throughout the city and it was aglow with the warm bask of those kerosene lamps. This story illustrates a great truth and that is that what we do is much more powerful than what we say. Words don't accomplish much. But what we do can change the world. People today are looking for a real love, God's kind of love. They're also looking for the truth, God's kind of truth, which is in short demand. And the kind of love and truth, that kind of love and truth 
must be demonstrated through the lives of God's children. We've all had people tell us that they love us, amen? <laughs> and you know when they're telling the truth, and you know when they're not most of the time, and even when you don't know for sure, sooner or later you find out whether they meant it or not, because what they do means a whole lot more than what they say. The world's kind of love lets you down, usually sooner than later. So what can we do about it? Instead of saying we love people, we can demonstrate our love to them. And I want you to know that I know I have a loving congregation. There's no doubt in my mind. You know, it's one thing to tell a woman that you love her. But it's another whole thing completely to tell her you love her and ask her to marry you. That is a completely, those are two completely different things. One is just words, and it doesn't have to mean anything in the long run. But one changes the lives of two people forever and starts a new beginning. Amen? When you, what you do is more important than what you say. If, to ask a woman to marry you is a commitment to love. It's like God's commitment to us. He loves us with an eternal love. God's love is a committed love. It's an unconditional love. We must be like Ben Franklin. He just didn't talk about lighting the city of brotherly love. He did it. And what? And we must light the lives of people with God's love so that they can feel the warmth of God's love in us. The most powerful testimony of any Christian is the way we love others. We must love in a way that they feel the warmth of God's love in our lives to the point that they want what we have. May I suggest that our good, Matthew 5, 16 says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Not only is loving people the right thing to do, but as we do it, as we give God the glory, it glorifies our Father in heaven, which is one of the reasons that we are here on this earth, to bring glory to God. May I suggest that our good deeds is to love others and to bring glory to God. Amen? I know that the Father and the Son, Jesus, loved me when I was unlovable. And I'm not going to talk about how unlovable I was. But he did it through people of a small church like this one. They were volunteers in the Lord's army, and their weapons were love and prayer. I've told you this before. After I was saved that night, I was talking to some of the people in the congregation, and uh, one of the men there, he's a doctor, and he was quite wise, and he told me, he said, Brother Larry, we all knew you were heading towards the altar, and we were just waiting for you to get smart enough to know you needed to go to. You know, they were praying for it. What he meant by that is that they were loving me and praying for me the whole time. They all knew I was a sinner. All they had to do was wait for me to find out that I was a sinner. And when that happened, I gave my life to God. And it changed me forever. Their love so impacted my life that I kept coming back for more and more and more. And I've heard testimonies from people in this church. In fact, I, I, I think it's uh, Henry and Ann who told me that they actually came to visit the church next door 20-some years ago. And they accidentally stumbled in here, and they found God's love, and they've been com coming ever since. Amen? I think that's the truth, right? Amen. They're shaking their heads. I knew it was somebody. I just didn't know it was them. And it, it may have been others. God's love has a way of changing our lives forever. And it's just not fair to not share that love with other people. One of the differences between love and money is that 
you get money and you can give it out at the end of the month and you usually run out, right? But when you get love from God, no matter how much you give away, you can never run out of God's love. It, it, it just doesn't run out. I would imagine that your story of how you came to know God is probably a lot like mine. And somewhere in it somewhere, there was the love of people loving you for God. John ended thir Corinthians 13 with this verse, and now these three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, I like to ask questions. And I kept thinking, well, why is, why is love the greatest? And I've read it many times, and I've studied it, and I'm not, this is not the first time I preached here on thir Corinthians 13. We know how important faith is to God. In fact, the Bible tells us that you cannot please God without faith. That makes faith pretty important, right? But clearly, the Word of God tells us that love is the key. Well, I have a couple trains of thought here, and I'm going to shortly go over them with you. First, I want you to know that hope and faith are primarily about ourselves. Now, I'm going to explain that so you can get right up to speed with me. What is hope? What is faith? Faith is what you believe about God and how it impacts your life. Now, I could give you the Bible definition of faith, and it's probably better than mine, but when the rubber meets the road, that's exactly what faith is. It's how what you believe about God impacts and changes your life and what you do. And what is hope? Hope speaks of what you believe about God as it is related to your futures. Our faith and our hope are important to God, but faith and hope primarily pertain to our own lives and how it affects us. Now, I'm not saying that our faith can't spread out and impact others, but first, it impacts our lives. But love can either be about us or it can be just as much about the people around us. As Christians mature, our love should become more and more about God and others. If you look at the world today, you look at the media in Washington, it's all about me. What have I done? What I'm doing great things for you. Even if they're lousy, they say they're great. Faith speaks about the past. Our faith says Jesus came. He took care of our sins on the cross of Calvary. We can look back to the cross and rest because Jesus forgave us for our sins. Thank God. Amen. Hope looks at the future. Our hope says Jesus is coming and my eternity is set. My Savior lives and because he lives, I will live. And that's exactly what the word of God tells us. Jesus says, because I live, you will live. But love is about right now. And hope, love is right now. It's what happens right now. Are we loving now? Are we loving God? Are we loving others? Are we sharing our love? Is our light shining to the world? Love is where our faith and hope becomes real and our lives reaches, reach out to others in God's love. Amen? That, that's what faith does and that's what hope does. It inspires us to reach out to others and say, Jesus loves you. There will come a day when we won't need faith and hope at all. It won't be while we're on this earth, but there will come a day, and that day is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. He's, Paul says, for now we see only a reflection in the mirror. He says, we only understand a little bit about God and what's going on. Then he said, but then when we get to heaven, we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, only part of the story, but then I will know fully. When we are in heaven, we will know the mysteries of God. 
we will see him face to face, and we won't need faith because God will have become a reality, just like it did for Sid and Georgia this week. They don't have to believe in God by faith anymore. They see Jesus face to face. Faith is not a part of their lives. We won't have to hope for anything because all the promises of God will have come true in our life when we get to heaven. Amen? But God's love is eternal. God will always love us. And if we're Christians, we will always love everyone else. There'll never be a time when God's love ceases to exist, when it doesn't reach out, when it doesn't satisfy all who trust in him. And that's why I believe that out of these three, faith, hope, and love, that love is the greatest. What a wonderful future God has for us. A time and a place where we will always be completely engulfed in the love of God. I want you to know that yesterday I even spoke of it in the funeral. It, it's wonderful to be in heaven where there's no more tears and no more sickness and no more death and there's streets of gold, and there's crystal fountains, and there's no more politicians. But the most wonderful thing of all is that we will be with God and be surrounded by his love forevermore. And there's no one here who can completely comprehend what that will be like. Oh, we can comprehend God's love because it's already changed our lives in such a way that it's, it's hard to imagine. But when we see him face to face, it's going to be a whole other kind of love. We can't even imagine what God has in store for us. One of the greatest things I love about God's gospel message is its simplicity. I think we often confuse God's nature and the complexities of our Father in heaven with the love of the gospel message. Speaking of God, in Isaiah 55, 8, 9, God says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. That pretty much tells us that we can't understand God. We have a complex God, one that we cannot understand or explain, even though we have this great need in our lives to understand him and to be able to explain him. I think I've known some people that thought if they could explain God to you good enough, then that must make them more important. That must make them smarter. That must make them better. We complicate him with our human efforts and our explanations. But at the same time, Jesus made the gospel message so simple that even a child can understand it. One of my instructors used to tell us, and he would tell us more than once, that you never preach up to the wisest person in your congregation. You always put all the good things of the gospel on the lowest shelf so even the smallest child can grasp it and comprehend it. Amen? And that's what Jesus has done for us. He's made the gospel so simple. I mean, our God is so complex. I can't explain to you even about God's love. My good friend, Reverend McGee, I heard him testify one time, and I don't know it was the last time, but he said he only ever spoke on 1 Corinthians 13 one time because he never felt adequate to be able to explain the love of God. I can't explain it all to you, but that what, that's what God has done. He's made the gospel so simple that all we need to do is love others. Amen? It's really easy. It's all that's involved is loving other people the way you would want them to love you. That's what Jesus said. Love them with all you are. Love them all the time. 
And one of the most important factors is make sure they know the reason you love them is because of Jesus. Give him the honor. Give him the glory. Never make it about yourself. Always make it about Jesus. I think that all Christians want to be identified as Christians. Amen. We want everyone to know we're Christians, what we stand for, that we believe in Jesus. We want people to know that. And that is a commendable and worthy goal. And Jesus tells us just how to do it. He, he, he tells us. He answers that question. Jesus, how do I show the world that I love you and that I'm a Christian? John 13, 34 and 35 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. And he says, and by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples and that you love one another. All you need is love. Amen? And as I said before, you... You are a very loving congregation. I felt your love from the very beginning. I, I told Lita when we left here that we're going to be pastors at that church. I don't even think you all even thought of me as a pastor yet. But somehow it came true. And I heard people who've attended here, some just a few times and some for many years, say the reason is that they feel the love of God here. But we must continue to grow in our love and be more Christ-like all the time. Amen? We, we never on this side of heaven can say, I'm there. <laughs> I'm just like Jesus. I love just like Jesus. Sid and Georgia can say it now, but we can. If love is the key, and we know that it is from God's word, then we need to learn to perfect our love more and more and become more Christ-like every day. And I want you to know, nothing will impact the love of other people like you sharing God's love with them. Expose them, infect them to the love of God. I know this is a very simple message, but I believe it is a very profound message too. That we need to hear from time to time, we need to be reminded that it's all about God and his love. Amen? Now, you all know it's the first of the month, and we usually try to have communion on the first of the month. So today we're going to have communion. And uh, if our ushers would come forth so that we can pass the elements out.
Jesus shared this memorial meal with his disciples, symbolizing that he was about to do on the cross of Calvary. Now when the hour came, Jesus took this, his, his place at the table and the apostles joined him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it again until the, it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it, gave it to, them, to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. After taking the cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood, the blood of the covenant that is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, from now on I will not drink of this fruit of the wine until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Well, praise the Lord. We love Jesus because he first loved us. And a miracle has truly happened today, right before your eyes. We had service. We sang songs. We preached. We had communion. And we're still 15 minutes ahead of schedule. So praise the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that for what you did on the cross of Calvary, that you gave yourself, all of yourself, everything, including your life, that we might live, that we could become the righteousness of Christ in your kingdom. We look forward to the day when one day we will be there with you, Lord. We thank you for all the blessings that you have given us. So many, Lord, that it would be impossible to count. We thank you, Lord, that your love is never-ending. We pray, Lord, that as we go from this place, that you would go with us and that you would help us to walk the paths of righteousness for your namesake and bring you glory. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.